thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, really appreciate you all being here. I know it's between food and alcohol, so thank you for turning up. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just talk about my experience at a financial institution, how we've chosen to use data a little bit more consciously and use that to take action and, and to sort of really think about how we're using that data for good. So to get started, can I get a show of hands of everyone who's seen The Matrix? As I expected, know your audience, right? Um, if, if anyone needs a recap, um, the main character of The Matrix Neo, he gets offered a blue pill or a red pill. So if he takes the blue pill, that's the choice of him putting his head in the sand. He gets to go back to his life, he gets to believe whatever he wants to believe, but it's the choice of being ignorant to what's actually going on. If he picks the red pill, however, he faces a really uncertain future, um, but he gets to learn the truth about what's going on. So he learns this uncomfortable truth, but he can now take action and influence the future. Might be a bit of a stretch, but I believe that with software delivery, we have the same choice. So we can choose the blue pill, we can keep looking for certainty, we can keep spending a lot of time wasting time on getting to certainty and estimating, or, um, so yeah, and we can just believe, you know, that illusion of the estimated date. Or we can take the red pill, and that's using data that tells us the truth, that software delivery is uncertain, and we can't possibly know the outcome on day one, so let's, let's stop trying. So I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes, uh, 20, 25 minutes, going through um, how we've used data, taking you down the rabbit hole a little bit on what we've um, done to find certainty. I'm going to use some real examples, so some real data examples, and show you how that's played through for us. A bit about me. <laughs> so I'm Julie Starling. I work for Principality Building Society. Um, the rugby fans amongst you might recognise the name because we sponsor the stadium in Cardiff, but we're, we're a small Welsh building society. I'm the practice manager for Agile Delivery, so that means I get to look after the Agile professionals in the company, help them to grow and coach the teams and the wider organisation. Uh, we're about a thousand people, we have three value streams, about five um, delivery teams in each of that. I've been um, working in and alongside software delivery teams for about 15 years now, so um, yeah, I'm just really passionate about using data to take action and ultimately get value to our customers. Enough about me. We go back to our blue pill and our red pill choice, so I'll talk a little bit about where we were and where we are now. So if we rewind about five, six years ago, we used to spend, uh, we used to have planning days, anyone here still have planning days? Uh, spend a lot of time planning, estimating, re-estimating, and because of that we were chasing deadlines. So we spent a lot of time um, missing those deadlines, then trying to go faster and re-estimating. We, you know, we all know that estimates are just the best guess with the information you have, so it's not surprising that they're wrong, things change. As we were re-estimating and as we were trying to go faster, ultimately what we were doing is solving symptoms, not problems. We weren't really solving the, um, we weren't really facing into the fact that, that looking for certainty wasn't working for us. So if we fast forward five years now, we now take a probabilistic approach to delivery. We use probabilistic forecasting alongside continuous conversations to make sure that we're looking at the signals in our data and that we're able to take action based on what we're seeing. We're able to have the right conversations. And on top of that, we're now using flow data and Dora metrics to help improve our um, practices and capabilities as we go. So before I get into this, I will caveat this with we are not perfect, we are still on our journey too. But I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you what we've done so far and a little bit about where we're going at the end. So software delivery. If we look back past the um, obvious interpretation of late, late to me represents mismanaged expectations. It means someone was expecting something specific by a specific date and they didn't get it which means it's likely we've been planning for certainty in an uncertain world. Really demotivating too. Anyone here that enjoys being late? No? <laughs> I, I've, heard the, I've heard the sort of um, 
the, the phrase, you know, you need a deadline, it drives urgency, without that the work will just go on and on and on. In my experience, the more often you're late, the less it means. The more often you're late, the less you care about being late. And it really sort of, you know, it's not a motivating place to be. And therefore, it drives unsustainable behaviours. That's where we see our quality getting impacted. That's where we can end up doing overtime, we can end up building up unnecessary amounts of technical debt. Not a great place to be. For me, the biggest thing is what it represents is a lost opportunity to take action. It's choices that we never got to make. So it means that, you know, something's changed along the way and either we haven't managed those expectations or we haven't done anything about it, we haven't taken that choice to change the future. <laughs> so this is a bit flippant. <laughs> I can never resist the uh, opportunity to quote Douglas Adams, a big fan. Um, so I said at the start, we're a financial institution, so we're regulated, right? We care about deadlines, unfortunately. Dates really matter to us. We deliver product-based, and we also deliver regulatory work. And this probabilistic approach works for both of those. As I said, though, um, we're not perfect. And sometimes we have to check ourselves, make sure we're not falling back into our old ways of working. When you're uncomfortable, that's when you go back to what you know. And for a lot of us, that's looking for certainty. So I'll start by talking about probabilistic forecasting. So when we talk about forecasts in any guise, so like if we think about the weather or economics, or in our case, software delivery, what we're saying is we're using past and present data to make a prediction about the future. So what does this look like? A forecast always has two things, a probabilistic forecast anyway. It has a probability and it has a range. So here's some examples of what that could look like. You can see they both look a little bit different, but they're both probabilistic forecasts. They tell us something different each. So one's going to tell us how much am I going to get by a date, and the other one's going to tell us when am I going to get it. So. The probability part of this statement is the 85% chance or the 75% chance. At Principality, we use 85%. There is no right or wrong here. But what you do need to remember is that when you pick an 85% chance or a 75% chance, so you're saying there's 85% chance something's going to happen, but there's also 15% chance that that's not going to happen as well, and that's really important. The range part of these statements are either the amount of work you're going to deliver or the date you're going to get it. Um, we need to be doing this continuously as well. This isn't a, a once a month, once a quarter thing. We're doing this all the time. A word of warning here. I don't know if anyone here has been using probabilistic forecasts, but the first thing our stakeholders see, is we take this first one for example, we're going to get it on the 31st of May. That's what they see. That's not what it says, but that's what they see. And that's a part of the education that we need to form alongside this, but I'll touch on that in a little bit. So, all sounds good. <laughs> what do you need to do to get started, right? Really, really simple. So, all we need is the cycle time of 10 or more items that were done by the same team and the future work needs to look like the past. So what do I mean by that? So cycle time, what I mean is the start and end point of your system, so however you've defined that. Same team, I mean you can't use one team's data to forecast for another team, that's just not how it works. And when I say the future needs to look like the past, I don't mean you need to be doing exactly the same work all the time. What I mean is, you can't fundamentally change the structure of the work, or you can't, like, how you break it down, or you can't fundamentally change your tech stack and expect to use the same data. But if that happens, you only need 10 items, so it doesn't take long to get started again. Once you've got this, what we do is run a Monte Carlo simulation, and this is where we lose people, because <laughs> that sounds complicated, it's not. We use um, Actionable Agile to do this. Um, I saw Tule in here, uh, Tule's at the back. Um, so Tule and Margot have a stand downstairs um, for the Actionable Agile project, pro uh, product. That's what we use. You don't have to, there are other ways of doing it, but this works for us. 
So I'm not going to get into the weeds on Monte Carlo forecasting. This is only a half hour talk. We do not have time for that. I will provide resources at the end and I'll give you a bit of a high level what it is. So um, when we do a Monte Carlo forecast, we ask one of two questions. We either say, when am I going to get something? Or how long is this thing going to take? And you ask it that question. It looks at the data you've given it and it randomly simulates how that could look. Just random simulation over your data. Then, it doesn't do that once. It does it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. In fact, actionable agile goes up to a million times. And what we're saying is out of those thousands of simulations, when there's an 85% chance of something happening on or before a date, 85% of those simulations came out on or before that date. In a nutshell, that's it. But if you want to come and talk to me, I'm here the next two days and we can go into it in more detail. And there will be resources at the end as well. So I probably might sound like I'm contradicting myself a little bit. So I'm saying, let's not estimate, let's not re-estimate, that's wasteful. But I want you to continuously forecast. Um, the difference here is forecasting is done on your data, it's done on what you already have, it takes no knowledge, it takes no expertise, it doesn't take anyone's time, you're not context, in, context switching people away from value. Probabilistic forecasts are run in seconds, they are really, really quick and that's why we can do it continuously. It's that, yeah, it lets you to be approximately right, not exactly wrong. So when we look at weather so if we look at what the weather's going to be in two weeks i think we all accept that it might change between now and then you might get more information something might happen we accept that that'll change we need to accept that's the same for software delivery too and it's not that we're removing certainty from people they never had that certainty anyway we're actually now giving them more information than they never had before so we do our probabilistic forecasts and we have these continuous conversations and I'll show you how this plays out. So, so this is going to be an example that um, we had probably about 18 months ago now. This is, was a brand new team. It was a prototype team we spun up. They wanted to test out new ways of working. We had some features to get over the line. And what this is going to show is as we go more Right, so I'm really bad with left and right. So it shows you how easy probabilistic forecasting is. I don't know my left and right, but I can do this. So um, we, we go um, more to the right and we're moving to the future. So the lines that way are moving more to the future. I'm going to introduce a red line now. And this red line is going to represent the amount of work we have left to do. So for us, this is user stories. It doesn't have to be. You could do it features, whatever, however you measure your work. So... This red line starting to move down, which represents we're, we're getting through our work items. So this was day one for the team. I'm going to introduce a second line to this chart now, so bear with me. <laughs> this second line is going to represent the forecasted date range for this team. So if it goes up, the date range is moving out. If it comes down, the date range is moving in. So you can see this line doesn't start at the same place as the red line. And that's because, as I said before, we need 10 or more items to get started. So we had to wait a little while to be able to forecast. So what we're seeing here is the forecasted date range on that day for the number of work items on that day using all the data we collected up until that point. And that's what we do all the way along this. So the team keeps delivering, the work items are going down, the forecast is remaining pretty stable then what happens is this. <laughs> so our, we, st we stop burning through any work items and our forecasted date range is moving out. This is our signal to have a conversation. Could be, could be completely innocent, right? Could be, you know, we found more complexity, we're splitting down work, um, or it could be we're blocked. What was actually happening here was There'd been a production issue and someone in the team had just caught wind of it, really helpful team, all jumped on to help and solve it. Didn't really help our situation here and they weren't actually the best place people to be doing it. So we had a conversation, moved the work out to another team and then this happened. Started burning through work again and our forecast stabilised. Worth taking a pause here to look at what's happened. So our forecasted date range is now later than it was. 
if we weren't having these conversations or looking at this data, this is the sort of stuff that you miss along the way. It's stuff that you just absorb and still think you can hit the date. You can now see the forecasted date ranges later, so we could either manage expectations or we could have a conversation about, okay, so do we need to cut a bit of scope? Do we maybe need to look at other options? We, we had a choice. This was the earliest possible opportunity we could take this action. Also, the forecasted date range has moved out, but it's not moved out as much as it would have if we did not caught this and not had this conversation. The next thing that happened, <laughs> and I don't know if anyone here has experienced this, it's the whole, whilst you're in there, can you also deliver this stuff? <laughs> now, you're in there anyway, this won't take long. Um, so normally there were two ways we would deal with this. We would re-estimate and figure out, okay, what, what, what would it take to include that? Or we would just absorb it and hope for the best. <laughs> what we were able to do is quickly run a forecast. It's not rocket science, right? We add more scope, the date goes out. But we could have really um, good conversations with our stakeholders and they could understand the cost of what they were asking us to do. So that all sounds good, but it's, it, takes, it takes a while to get there. This isn't something that just happens overnight. I spent a lot of time talking to lots of people in the organisation, so from the teams to the stakeholders, and explaining what this could give us, you know, the power of being able to see things unfold in real time and being able to approximately know when we're going to get something and how it's influenced by what's going on. And that's all fine. It's really easy to get nods and agreements. People are like, yeah, that, that, that sounds good. What you find, though, is, as I mentioned before, is as we're going through this and as um, the dates are moving in undesirable directions, people revert to type and they'll look for that certainty. They'll be looking for, okay, so ca can, you just, can you just estimate, can you just get us the date? And this is where we need to double down on the education. We need to be telling them, no, we're giving you more information, not less. If we give you a date, it doesn't mean this stuff isn't happening. It just means you don't know about it. With the teams, for education for the teams, I could say we were probabilistically forecasting, we're capturing cycle time. Actually, you're already capturing all your flow metrics, whether you realise it or not. If you imagine this is our system, so cycle time is at the start and end point of your system, all these green dots are um, work items, so for us user stories. If we've got a work item that's got a start date but not an end date, we know exactly how old it is, which is our item age, and that's a really, really important uh, metric. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll get onto this with a real example in a couple of slides. Also, everything that has a start date but not an end date, you add it all up, that's your work in progress. And finally, we know our end date, so we know the rate at which we're delivering, so we know our throughput. So I'll take this to a real example as well. So don't get overwhelmed with this. This is a cycle time scatter plot if you've not seen one before. Um, all of these bleed blue dots represent a work item that has been completed. So along the bottom is the date on which it was completed. And on the left-hand side <laughs> is, the, um, is the cycle time, so how long it took to complete. Um, this was a team that, you know, we were like, we, we need to get better, we need to figure something out. And what we could see here, that what this chart is telling us, is that a lot of our items that were completed were taking longer than our sprints, which, you know, we kind of knew we were rolling things over, but the data really showed us this. So what we did was decide to have a bit of an experiment. I sort of proposed we, we, we brought in whip limits. And we didn't, we didn't go too heavy on this. We just put a system whip limit on. So for the whole system, how many items we could have in there. Um, the team responded really interestingly to this. It felt, made them feel a little bit uncomfortable. So we'd gone from chaos, context switching, really, really busy to just delivering work. And it felt a bit like they, they weren't as busy. They didn't feel as productive. This is what the data showed, however. <laughs> we kept our throughput and our cycle times were reduced. We were getting more feedback. We were able to um, sort of really improve on that um, feedback loop. This um, also gives us the opportunity to do what's called a single item forecast. So I talked about um, probabilistic forecasting at the start, which is multiple item forecasting. We can also do single item forecasting. 
So this is exactly the same chart, exactly the same data. However, you'll notice there's um, percentile lines on the side. These are percentile lines. They are not means, they are not averages, they are not standard deviations, they are percentile lines. And what this means is that um, all of the items, so let's take the 85% line, all of the items under this line were completed, in this example, 21 days or less. And what this allows us to do is set an expectation for how long it's going to take to deliver a single item. So this is this chart, if you can read the bottom, <laughs> was done in 2018. So we were in the office, this is pre-COVID, and this would be on our board. Why this is important is item age. So what we could do every day is we could look how old our in-flight items were and compare them to that SLE. So we could see when we were creeping like, into the danger zone where we needed to take action and work on our flow. What this also does is gives us, it gave us the opportunity to show people that the previous estimation model was not working for us and it was an illusion, it was that blue pill. So does anyone want to hazard a guess what that um, top dot what the story points were for that. So we've got seven. Yeah, it's, your answers are as random as this is. <laughs> so story points were never meant to equate to time, yet we use them to plan and we use them to set expectations. So what I've done here is colour code all those dots with the story point estimates they were given. This is not a team that was bad at estimation, by the way. This happens team after team. I do this with, with quite a lot of teams. And it also doesn't matter if they're estimating in points or days or hours. This is how it plays out. <laughs> Anyone surprised by this? No. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we've got to keep using the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even like you can see after the WIP limit um, experiment, the blue dot, which is three points, varies between one and ten days. There is no correlation. <laughs> Finally, throughput. Sorry, I'm just, uh, just conscious of time. So we um, also know the rate at which we're um, delivering work. This green line represents the throughput trend line, so how much we were doing over time. This was really early into the metrics where we were using the metrics to influence our ways of working and make those tweaks like the WIP limit experiment. And as you can see, this is going up nicely. A great sort of signal to show that our experiments are working. This doesn't always go up, and when it doesn't, it's another signal. We get to have another conversation. Sometimes it's genuine reasons, right? We have Christmas, we go on holiday, sometimes we're blocked. There's, there's lots of things, and this is about the conversation. This isn't about the data telling us to do anything. So we are well and truly down the rabbit hole. We have taken our red pill. We know we're better now than we ever have been before, but we've still got a long journey ahead of us. So we are what I would call as non-optimal on our, what we've branded our path to life. So our practices, our technology, our processes in terms of getting value out to the customer. And we knew we still wanted to use a data-driven approach to this. What capabilities to target, what practices to target. And we found our aspirations aligned really closely with DORA, which is a DevOps research assessment. And that represents over eight years of research to over, uh, covers over like 33,000 professionals worldwide. If anyone's not familiar with this, I'd really recommend going to the link down there. What you're able to do is a bit of a quick check tool to see how you compare to the rest of your industry. It also gives you a list of capabilities and practices that you can improve to help improve your software delivery performance. So as an organization, we aligned with this, aligned with the capabilities and practices we might need to work on and the metrics in which they are advised to use. So we'll start with lead time. So whatever you think about lead time, Dora's definition is from code commit to production. And this is very similar to a cycle time in that it has a start and an end point. So we can plug that into our scatter plots, we can get SLEs, we can look at patterns and that's what we do. We also have deployment frequency, is what it says on the tin, how often you deploy. Then time to restore, so every time there is a loss of service that impacts a customer, how quickly we're able to restore that. And then finally, our change failure percentage. So of every, of every time, uh, every thing we deliver, how much of that um, requires remediation, a bug fix, a rollback, whatever it is. 
What's really important here is that we look at them together. So we're constantly looking at these metrics, but we're not looking at one, in t one at a time. So we don't want our lead time to go down, but be spent sending our change failure percentage through the roof. So we're having continuous conversations about these two. So we decided we want to look at these capabilities. We know how we're going to measure them. And then we wanted to do some focused improvement. So we understood our system. We knew there was no point in improving our capabilities at section A, B, or D, because that wouldn't actually influence you know, what we get out of the system. There is a bottleneck at C here, which means we're not getting out more than one widget a day. So we needed to make sure we focused all our capability and practice improvements on section C. So we came up with a bunch of experiments and hypotheses on how, how, how we could target this and what we thought we could do. We're now in this phase, you know, this is really early days for us, we're now in this phase where we're doing that, we're picking the most um, sort of uh, the ones that have got the highest sort of hypothesis to our metrics ratio and then we are implementing that and measuring it and then making sure it's our bottleneck still in the same part of our system. So yeah, <laughs> that's where we are. What we've um, done now is we use probabilistic forecasting because software delivery isn't certain and we need to stop treating it like it is. We have continuous conversations now so that we're managing expectations and we're managing risks, which means now we're solving problems instead of symptoms. So instead of trying to go faster or estimate better, we're now solving the problems along the way. We also use flow metrics to help us continuously improve as teams and just to get better at delivery and DORA data now because we want to improve our capabilities and practices. We are a 160-year-old business, so as you can imagine, there's a bunch of legacy tech in there, as well as some newer, newer tech. There's cultural changes to make, and DORA is really helping us get a view of what we've got now and how we can improve. Here's some of the resources I said I provide. Um, the slides will be available after this, so don't worry if this goes a bit fast. Um, the two on the end, I'd really recommend if you're trying to get into this with Dan Vacanti and actually the top talk um, there. That's the one that got me all into this. I went to Agile Cymru about six years ago, saw Dan Vacanti to do his talk, and I've ended up down this wormhole, so come join me. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you.